دكتور حنان انزي بالعربي والشيفت انتو We'll switch into Arabic, uh, Dr. Richard. So please uh, listen to the translation and tell us uh, that they are doing a good job. So I did come a Professor Hartnett, Professor Kamal. وأعتقد أن دكتور كمال سيحدثنا في المقام الأول عن مكان السياسة الخارجية في الانتخابات المقبلة. كما يعبر عنها مرشحة الرئاسة الآن وأيضا سيحاول أن يطلعنا على موقف المرشحين من النظام الدولي بصفة عامة ومن القضايا الكبرى أو القضايا العالمية الكبرى ثم سيقوم بروفيسور كمال بإعطائنا يعني شرحا مبسطا أو شرحا يعني ليس طويلا لأثر هذه الرؤية للعالم الخارجي والتي يتبناها المرشحان على الشرق الأوسط وعلى مصر على وعالمنا العربي ومصر على وجه فليبدأ دكتور محمد كمال شكرا جزيلا للصوت الدكتورة حنان وشكرا لسيادة العميدة دكتورة شيرين ودكتور محمد مطاوع والدكتورة عبير وبحييكم الحقيقة جميعا على الجهد الكبير المبذول في هذا السيمينار المتميز Let me say a few words in English. I'm happy to be in this seminar also with uh, Dr. Uh, Richard. I'm glad to know that he's also, uh, he has a PhD from uh, Johns Hopkins, but I guess he went to uh, Baltimore. I went to SAIS in, in Washington, DC, but uh, same, uh, same university. And uh, he raised uh, many points on foreign policy, and I actually agree with all of them. And there, therefore, uh, part of my presentation will sound like just uh, the Arabic translation of, uh, of what he said. لكن خلونا أبدأ كده في البداية أتكلم إن إحنا يعني بصدد انتخابات في غاية الأهمية سيكون لها تأثير كبير سواء على الداخل الأمريكي أو على علاقات الولايات المتحدة بالعالم فوز ترامب بهذه الانتخابات هينقلنا من ما يسمى بلحظة ترامب أو ترامب مومنت إلى مرحلة ترامب ترامب إيرا بمعنى البعض كان بينظر أن دي مرحلة قصيرة وهتعدي ولن تترك أثر استمراره في البيت الأبيض لأربع سنوات قادمة سوف يؤدي إلى مأسسة الكثير من سياساته وما نراه الآن أنه يعني أبنورمال أو غير طبيعي سوف يصبح طبيعي آه وصول أيضا آه بايدن إلى البيت الأبيض آه سوف يؤدي إلى تحولات ضخمة آه داخليا وخارجيا وبالتالي نحن بصدد يعني انتخابات آه بيسموها ترانسفورماتيف لأنها سوف تغير أو تحول في آه الولايات آه المتحدة بالنسبة لقضايا السياسة الخارجية يعني الناخب عادة في الولايات المتحدة لا يضع في اعتباره ولا يهتم بقضايا السياسة الخارجية عندما يذهب إلى التصويت. يمكن في مقولة شهيرة للرئيس السابق بيل كلينتون كان بيقول لما كل ما بيطلع في حملات انتخابية الأسئلة اللي بيجيله في مجال السياسة الخارجية تأتي فقط من الصحفيين يعني ما فيش أي حد من المواطنين العاديين بيهتم قوي بقضايا السياسة الخارجية لكن الحقيقة القضايا السياسة الخارجية بتصبح مهمة لما المرشح بيربطها بقضايا الداخل الأمريكي وبالتالي تصبح امتداد لقضايا الداخل الأمريكي يعني في أمثلة كتيرة يعني الحظر البترولي على الولايات المتحدة سنة 73 هو اللي خلى الكثير من الأمريكيين يهتموا بموضوع الشرق الأوسط 
احداث 11 سبتمبر جوه امريكا والاهتمام بقضايا الارهاب. الان الحقيقه في الانتخابات الحاليه في عدد من القضايا الخارجيه لها امتداد داخلي وبالتالي الراي العام والناخب بيهتم بيها. على راسها بالتاكيد موضوع الصين لانه مرتبط بموضوع كورونا وقبل كورونا كان مرتبط بالاوضاع الاقتصاديه والاتهام الموجه للصين بانها بتغرق الاسواق بسلع معينه بتؤثر على العماله بتؤثر على الاقتصاد الامريكي وبالتالي موضوع خارجي ولكن له بعد مهم داخلي موضوع الهجره وهو ايضا مرتبط بالعلاقه بدول امريكا اللاتينيه بالدول الاسلاميه قضية خارجية ولكن لها امتداد داخلي لأنه الرئيس ترامب بيستخدمها للدلالة على أن المهاجرين بياخدوا الوظائف بتاعة الأمريكيين هم مصدر العنف والجرائم إلى قضية أخرى الحقيقة هي قضايا المتعلقة بالبيئة يعني في المناظرة الانتخابية الأخيرة كان في جدل بين الرئيس ترامب ونائب الرئيس بايدن حول مسألة البترول واستخدام البترول والطاقة التقليدية والنائب الرئيس بايدن بيقول هيتحول إلى طاقة جديدة فالرئيس ترامب قال له يعني أنت عايز تغلق صناعة البترول وقال يا ناس يا في تكساس أو اسمعوا بايدن عايز يغلق صناعة البترول موضوع الطاقة الجديدة ده مرتبط بالبيئة مرتبط ببروتوكولات بروتوكول باريس إلى آخره وبيسمع مع الناس لانه ليه بعد داخلي. قضيه اخيره لها ايضا بعد داخلي ولكن هنا مرتبطه بال يعني القاعده الانتخابيه او بالناخبين المصوتين وهي اسرائيل. اسرائيل دائما كانت جزء من الحسابات الانتخابيه ليس فقط يعني لجذب اصوات اليهود الامريكيين ولكن بالنسبه للحزب الجمهوري لجذب اصوات ما يسمى بالطائفه الانجيليه المسيحيه اللي هي الحقيقه بتمثل جزء اساسي من القاعده الانتخابيه لترامب عشان كده انا من وجهه نظري الحقيقه سواء بدءا من قرار نقل السفاره الامريكيه من تل ابيب للقدس انتهاء بالاجراءات اللي بتتعلق بالتطبيع وانها واخده صداره الهدف منها هو تعبئه هذه الطائفه الانجيليه اللي بتنظر لاسرائيل بشكل معين انها الارض الذي سوف يعود اليها المسيح في نهايه الزمان والحرب بين الخير والشر الى اخره. فانا عايز اكد مره اخرى قضايا السياسه الخارجيه لا تهم الناخب الا اذا كان لها ارتباط داخلي وذكرت عدد من القضايا اللي لها ابعاد داخلي. طب ايه يعني اوجه التشابه والاختلاف بين بايدن وترامب في مجال السياسه الخارجيه؟ انا رايي انه السياسه الخارجيه لن تحتل الصداره او الاولويه لديهما في الفتره الثانيه. السبب الرئيسي كورونا والاثر الاقتصادي الضغط اللي تركته على المجتمع الامريكي والاقتصاد الامريكي فالاولويه للاثنين هتكون للاقتصاد واعاده بناء الاقتصاد. بايدن هيحط على الاجنده بتاعته ايضا ربما اكثر من ترامب اللي هو حاله الاستقطاب اللي موجوده في الولايات المتحده حاله غير مسبوقه ولم تشهدها الولايات المتحده وبالتاكيد يعني ترامب دعم هذا الامر لانه في كثير من الاحيان لا ينظر لنفسه على انه رئيس لكل الامريكيين ولكن رئيس لناخبيه او القبيله التي ينتمي اليها. بايدن بيقول انا الحقيقه رئيس لكل الامريكيين وبالتالي سيحاول ان يبذل جهد في يعني انه يبقى في قدر من الوحده بين الشعب الامريكي مره اخرى. وبالتالي لا أتوقع سياسة خارجية ناشطة للاثنين بايدن على وجه التحديد أيضا بما أنه اهتمامه بالأساس هيبقى الاقتصاد وقضايا الاستقطاب هيبقى هدفه الابتعاد عن التورط في أي مشكلة خارجية قد 
تبعد اهتمامه وطاقته عن القضايا الداخلية قبل ما اخش في القضايا المختلفة وإيه الفرق أو التشابه بينهم برضو اختلاف بين بايدن وترامب يتعلق بعملية صنع القرار في مجال السياسة الخارجية بالنسبة لترامب كما شاهدنا في السنوات السابقة المسألة كانت مرتبطة بشخصه ومجموعة من الأشخاص يمكن يتعدوا على أصابع اليد الواحدة اللي مرتبط بيهم محل ثقة اللي موجودين في البيت الـ الـ الأبيض ولكن كان في دور محدود للمؤسسات التقليدية لعملية صنع القرار أنا أعتقد وصول بايدن إلى البيت الأبيض سوف يؤدي إلى يعني إعادة دور المؤسسات مرة أخرى إعادة دور مجلس الأمن القومي الخارجية الدفاع المخابرات مراكز الأبحاث إلى آخره فهتبقى عملية صنع القرار شكلها مختلف بالنسبة لقضايا محددة في مجال السياسة الخارجية أبدأ بالعلاقة مع القوى الكبرى خاصة روسيا والصين ترامب استنادا لاستراتيجية الأمن القومي اللي صدرت في عهده بيصف روسيا والصين بأنهما يعني دولتان منافستان للولايات المتحدة وعودة ما يسمى اللي هو Great Power Competition أو عودة التنافس بين القوى الكبرى وطبق ده بشكل واضح فيما يتعلق بالصين وبدرجة أقل فيما يتعلق بروسيا وبدأنا نسمع عن عودة الحرب الباردة في الشهور الأخيرة الحقيقة فيما يتعلق بالصين على وجه التحديد بدأ كلام يطلع من وزير خارجية بومبيو يبدو كأنه دعوة لتغيير النظام في الصين إن المسألة مش بس اقتصاد لا ده في اختلاف في القيم اختلاف في الأيديولوجية إلى إلى فواضح في فجوة كبيرة في بين الصين والولايات المتحدة فيما لو استمر ترامب أنا أعتقد أيضا وصول بايدن هيؤدي إلى استمرار نهج التشدد تجاه الصين وبالإضافة لملفات الاقتصاد والتجارة هيتم فتح ملفات أخرى زي قضايا الديمقراطية وقضايا حقوق الإنسان ودي الحقيقة يعني عايز أقول أنه بغض النظر يصل ديمقراطي أو جمهوري في تغير هيكلي في السياسة الخارجية الأمريكية فيما يتعلق بالصين لفترة كان في توافق أمريكي على ما يسمى دمج الصين في النظام الدولي Integrating China into the global system وإن فكرة دمج الصين في النظام الدولي هيجعلها تلتزم بقاعد النظام الدولي هيجعل نموها وتطورها سلمي وهيؤدي إلى تحسن العلاقة مع الولايات المتحدة والغرب وإنه هينش طبقة متوسطة سوف تدعو إلى الديمقراطية إلى أخر ده الحقيقة كان واضح جدا يعني يمكن فترة الرئيس بيل كلينتون وبعد كده الرئيس أوباما أنا أعتقد النظرية دي سقطت سقطت لدى الليبراليين وسقطت لدى المحافظين الجمهوريين وأنه اكتشفوا أو وجهة النظر هي أن هذا الاندماج أو دمج الصين في النظام الدولي أدى إلى تقوية الصين وأدى إلى أن الصين أصبحت أكثر عدائية وأكثر تنافسية مع الولايات المتحدة وبقى لها رؤيتها الخاصة لتغيير النظام الدولي وبالتالي هناك تحول هيكلي فيما يتعلق بالصين نحو احتواء الصين نحو محاصرة الصين وليس دمج الصين والهدف هو الحد من سرعة الصعود الصيني الكل متأكد أن الصين في طريق صعود ولكن كيف يتم عرقلة هذا الصعود أعتقد في توافق بين ترامب وبين بايدن في هذا الأمر بالنسبة لروسيا ما بتكرش هيبقى في تباين كبير في المواقف ولكن بايدن هيبقى أقل إعجابا لبوتين يعني, آه يعني في قدر من الإعجاب آه لبوتين لدى الرئيس آه آه ترامب 
وبالتالي هذا البعد الشخصي في العلاقة سوف ينتفي وسوف يكون هناك أيضا قدر من التشدد سواء بايدن وصل أو استمر ترامب دكتور ريتشارد اتكلم على العلاقة بين الحلفاء مسألة مهمة جدا أعتقد هيبقى في اختلاف احنا شفنا ترامب تصرفاته أحادية انفرادية لا يهتم بالتشاور مع الحلفاء لا يهتم بحلف شمال الأطلنطي يطلب من الحلفاء دفع أي تكلفة تقوم بها الولايات المتحدة في الدفاع عنهم يعني باختصار بيعتقد أن الحلفاء بيستغلوا الولايات المتحدة وعليهم دفع ثمن الخدمات اللي بتقدمها الولايات المتحدة بايدن حقيقة يعني هيبقى أكثر اهتماما بالحلفاء من أول الخطوات اللي أعتقد هيعملها إنه هيدعو إلى مؤتمر يدعو فيه حلفاء الولايات المتحدة الأساسيين للتنسيق والتشاور وخاصة الحلفاء الأوروبيين واليابان سوف يعود للاهتمام مرة أخرى بحلف شمال الأطلنطي وبالمؤسسات متعددة الأطراف الأمم المتحدة الجاد وأي في الأغلب الأعم أو من أولى الخطوات اللي هي تبناها هو العودة مرة أخرى لبروتوكول باريس الخاص بالبيئة وربما العودة لاتفاق التجارة الحرة مع دول المحيط الهادي وسواء اتفاق باريس أو الاتفاق مع المحيط الدول المحيط الهادي ترامب كان وقعهم أوباما وترامب انسحب منهم وأعتقد بايدن سوف يعود إليهم بالنسبة للشرق الأوسط أنا رأيي نقطة مشتركة بين ترامب وبايدن هو أن الاهتمام بمنطقة الشرق الأوسط سيكون محدود والمنطقة لن تكون لها أولوية في استراتيجية الأمن القومي الأمريكي أو السياسة هذا لا يعني الانسحاب تماما وترك فراغ ولكن لن تحتل أولوية الشرق الأوسط أهمية الولايات المتحدة انخفضت بشكل كبير الاحتياج لبترول الشرق الأوسط انخفض بشكل كبير الولايات المتحدة في طريقها للاكتفاء الذاتي من الطاقة دي نقطة النقطة الثانية أنه صانع القرار الأمريكي بيرى أن هناك فرص في أكبر في مناطق أخرى ومشاكل أكبر في مناطق أخرى الصين جزء أساسي من هذا التفكير وأسيا بشكل عام فانتقال الاهتمام هيبقى نحو أسيا ويعني بنأكد أنه إدارة أوباما اللي بايدن كان نائب الرئيس فيها هي اللي اخترعت ما يسمى pivot to Asia أو التحول إلى أسيا أنا أعتقد ده يعني مسار متصاعد وأحد انعكاساته هو أن الاهتمام بمنطقة الشرق الأوسط سوف ينهض نقطة الاختلاف الرئيسية بين بايدن وترامب هتبقى إيران بايدن سوف يعود لاتفاق خمسة زائد واحد اتفاق النووي ترامب الحقيقة هيستمر في الضغوط دكتور محمد كمان دكتور محمد ممكن معلش دكتور محمد دكتور محمد ممكن بعد إذن حضرتك معلش تو سويتش انتو انجليش لأنه السامع يا دكتور الصوت بيقطع آه ممكن بعد إذن حضرتك معلش ممكن ننقل للإنجليزي لأنه ريتشارد ما عندوش ولا ترجمة وصلاله فللأسف بس تقول الباقي بالإنجليزي وبعدين تقدر تدي بريف يعني بالإنجليزي عن اللي قلته معلش طب خليني أقول بالعربي أخلص وبعدين أقوله بالإنجليزي بريف ماشي طيب طيب أنا بقول في نقطة اختلاف إيران بايدن هيعود لاتفاق خمسة زائد واحد ترامب هيستمر في الضغط على إيران والحقيقة في توصيات دلوقتي أنه يفرض حتى ضغوط أكتر خلال الأيام القادمة ولكن الحقيقة أيضا في فرصة لاتفاق مع إيران ولكن الاتفاق أو ما يسميه يعني ترامب الصفقة مع إيران ولكن بالتأكيد هذه الصفقة سوف يكون شكلها مختلف عن مجرد العودة إلى الاتفاق مع إيران اللي هو اتفاق خمسة زائد واحد 
عملية السلام في الشرق الأوسط ترامب لو استمر سوف يستمر فيما يسمى صفقة القرن مزيد من دفع الدول العربية للتطبيع مع إسرائيل لو وصل بايدن ستسقط صفقة القرن ولكن لن يحل محلها أي شيء يعني لن نبنى أجندة معينة أو رؤية معينة وبالتالي ستبقى الأوضاع على ما هي عليه كلمة أخيرة بالنسبة لمصر والولايات المتحدة يعني أيا كان من سيكون في البيت الأبيض سوف تستمر العلاقة كعلاقة استراتيجية ولكن بالتأكيد العلاقة مع إدارة بايدن سوف تكون أقل دفئا وأكثر صخبا مما هي عليه لو استمر ترامب في البيت الأبيض وأتوقف 19 دقيقة ونص تمام؟ خلاص هل أنا عايز بس أشوف يعني هو دكتور ريتشارد كان بيهز في راسه أنا عايز أعرف هل وصلته ترانسليشن ولا حاجة ولا حاجة يا دكتور ولا حاجة معلش صور ريتشارد دكتور ريتشارد يو بريف أباوت وات هي سيد ديد يو هير أني Did you hear any of the translation? Were you able to follow anything? Uh, uh, anything from Professor Kamel's lecture? Yeah, so unfortunately we, we were not able to, the, when the translation uh, was, um, uh, okay. when there was some translation, we, I could not hear it because uh, uh, his, we couldn't. Uh, you hear both Dr. Kamel and the translator okay. at okay. the time. So, yeah. okay, I'll, I'll try right to sum now, up. If, if we could, because I, I can, the translator is, is speaking over uh, the, the, the two of you. So um, I think it would be better if we just uh, listen to uh, Professor Kamal. And, and it's fine, because um, I know I have some colleagues here in the US who are also listening in. So if, I sure. don't well, know what well, I, fin I, I finished in Arabic, so let me. Uh, try to summarize that in a um, in sure. few minutes, if I can. Um, uh, I start by saying this is a transformative uh, elections. It will have great impact domestically and on uh, US relationship with the, with the world. If Trump is reelected, then we're moving from the Trump moment to a Trump uh, era. His policies will be institutionalized. He will take over the Republican Party. What seems to be abnormal will be uh, normal in the, in the future. It will be also transformative if uh, Biden comes to the White House because of the change in uh, background, the ideological orientation, and, and so on. I also said that uh, voters in the US do not usually care about foreign policy unless it is connected to a domestic issue. And in this campaign, we have uh, many uh, foreign policy issues that have domestic links, like uh, China, uh, connected to Corona and the economy, uh, immigration, the environment connected to the oil industry. And we heard in the, in the third debate, or the second debate, actually, uh, you know, I talk about that and uh, the, the new energy, the green energy, and, and, and so on. And I said some foreign policy issues are important because um, some constituency care about them. And in, in this election, Israel is, is important, not only because, uh, or issues related to Israel are important, not only because of the uh, Jewish vote, but also because of the evangelicals. And uh, I claim that many of the policies um, uh, implemented by the Trump uh, administration, starting from moving the American embassy from Tel Aviv to uh, Jerusalem, and ending up with the normalization between Israel and our uh, and, and, and Arab countries were mainly motivated by the evangelical uh, votes and Trump's uh, attempt to energize and mobilize uh, this uh, vote. Um, uh, with regards to their stand on foreign policy, our uh, argument, as you, as you also uh, mentioned, priority will be giving to the economy because of the impact to uh, Corona. Uh, uh, 
Biden will will focus also on the trying to to put an end to the division and polarization that exists in the U.S. and will portray himself as a president for all uh, American and will try to uh, to to do uh, some initiatives with regard to that. If Biden is the president, we will see an institutionalization of foreign policy making. You know, as you mentioned, Trump was and will continue to, to be the main figure in making foreign policy or foreign policy that he cares about, issue that he cares about. If Biden is in the White House, then you will see a, a revival of fall of institution, State Department, defense, even, even think tanks. Uh, uh, with regards to uh, great powers, uh, China, and uh, I think uh, I agree with what you said. I don't need to, to repeat it, but I, I argued that there is a structural change in, in the U.S. in general with uh, liberals and conservatives on China. I, I, there is um, uh, an end to what has been known as the integration theory, integrating China, hope into the global system, hoping that it will moderate, it will rise peacefully, and you know there will be a middle class that will you know demand democracy. I think, or my interpretation is that there is an end to that uh, at both or with both liberals and conservative, and the new policy will be containing China, how to prevent the speed or to slow down the speed of the rise of, uh, of China. And there will be no big difference uh, between Biden and uh, Trump on that, uh, on that issue. Uh, I also repeated what you said about relationship with allies. Uh, Trump would emphasize allies, uh, multilateral efforts, uh, 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 NATO, uh, going back to the Paris Agreement uh, on the environment, maybe going back to the free trade agreement with the, with the countries of the, of the Pacifics, the Pacific, uh, the Pacific Ocean. With regard to the Middle East, um, I argued that uh, both countries, both candidates will not give priority to the Middle East. The, the way they perceive the Middle East uh, is that it is less important from a strategic point of view to the US. The US is less reliant today on, uh, on Middle East oil. Uh, it, uh, it's moving into self-sufficiency. And there are regions like Asia where you have more opportunities and more threats also coming from China. So you will divert attention to, uh, to Asia uh, from uh, the Middle East. There will be a difference, huge difference between the two of them on Iran. Biden will go to the uh, nuclear agreement five plus uh, one. Trump will continue to put pressure, but there is an opportunity also to reach an agreement, what Trump calls at the Iran deal. But this Iran deal will be different from five plus one uh, agreement. On the peace process, if Trump is in office, the deal of the century will, will continue, more normalization will continue with Israel. If Trump, if Biden is elected, I think the, the deal of the century will vanish, but there will be nothing to replace it. I don't think uh, Biden will come up with any major initiative on that. Uh, on that issue. Last word in Egypt, the relationship between Egypt and the US will continue to be strategic or described as strategic, but under uh, a Biden administration, it will be less warm and more noisy and more controversial than it is uh, currently under uh, Trump. And I end with that, thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, that brilliant summary. I'm, I'm sorry I missed the entire talk because that's uh, a fantastic analysis. Thank, Thank you. you, Richard. Let's give it a last try. And please look at the caption where you have interpretation. Did you select the English? I did. 
and English. then you will have you will have be, below this if you click English and then you click back on the, on the icon of English, you will find unmute original audio. Yeah, it says mute original audio, and that's what I've been doing. Uh, so you you muted this, and still you uh, could hear both. Uh, mistake, uh, if if he did a mistake in the debate, was that he he did not make it clear um, what he has said in other areas, which is that this will take time. So he's not going to lose jobs in the oil industry. Uh, but he's going to transition them to better jobs. Um, so he's been trying to correct that uh, debate issue, but he probably lost uh, Texas uh, on the margins uh, because of that, that, that comment. But there's always these domestic groups that matter um, at a general level and then not necessarily on an electoral level. So the Jewish vote right now in terms of the Jewish population in the United States uh, concentrates itself in democratic states that like these are states that Biden are going to win. So the interesting thing from, uh, and I think uh, Professor Kamel was that you're exactly correct that Trump policy to Israel has very little to do with the Jewish vote. It has everything to do with the evangelical vote. And the evangelical vote is spread across the Midwest and spread across these very important states that are going to decide the election. So um, if there is a domestic connection to foreign policy regarding the Middle East, it is primarily in cultivating evangelical support uh, of the state of Israel. And so why you saw this push towards um, some of the recognition um, uh, that that have occurred over the last few months. So it's interesting to think, right, that when you think about Israeli policy, it's not about the Jewish vote. It's about a Christian vote. Uh, but that's, in fact, uh, what's, what's going on uh, with that. So th this whole deep state thing, which then goes into uh, some of the QAnon conspiracies and things of this nature, Let's step back and understand that uh, the deep state, by another name, is called bureaucracy, right? Uh, and so uh, all states have to have bureaucratic systems and processes and expertise to run effectively, right? And Republican, the Republican Party had always been semi-skeptical about career politicians and the government. And it used to be about the size of government, right? So traditional Republicans ran against big government, which meant the size of government and the amount of government action coming out of Washington. Trump took it an, a, a step further, right? And he made it about competency and he made it about so that the bureaucracy is incompetent, mm -hmm. right? And in fact, uh, that it was this um, self-perpetuating elite. So it didn't matter whether you were Republican or Democrat, right? It was the elite. And instead of using that language, which is very class-based, mm -hmm. right? He used this conspiracy language of the deep state versus the regular person. Mm -hmm. Right. And because class politics had always been sort of a democratic thing mm -hmm. and that didn't necessarily play well in the United States. So he made this very nuanced argument, which worked. Right. Like I'm this millionaire. Forget about that. I'm here for the for the guy who's not represented. Yeah. And so if you look to your question about Ohio. What I would argue from. Mm -hmm. And it was the same group that voted for President Obama in 08 and 2012. And it was this group, and it, it, and it was the groups in Pennsylvania and in Michigan and Wisconsin. And these were voters that needed and wanted change. Right? And if you recall in, 20, uh, in 2008, Obama ran as the change candidate. And then in 2012, he ran as the change candidate again, 
saying that he was being blocked by the Republicans. So he wasn't able to do all the change that he wanted and he needed a Democratic Congress. In 2016, the Democrats ran the most establishment candidate in their history. Hillary Clinton represented the establishment. Mm -hmm. And Trump was all was the change candidate. And he is running as the change candidate again. And Biden is running not as the establishment candidate, but as the stability candidate. Mm -hmm. right? So what I would argue is that in 2008 and in 2012 and in 2016, those voters didn't change. Mm -hmm. They voted for the change candidate. It was who was the change candidate, the Democrat, and then it became the Republican. And so what's very interesting and why this is still very close in Ohio, although it's swung now eight percentage points, right? So it's almost tied. And why uh, some of the polls have Biden up in Pennsylvania and other states is I think that there's, there's a group that wanted change, but, this is, but didn't want chaos. Mm -hmm. Right. And that when you look at the handling of the virus, the fact that the economy is 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 uh, collapsed because of the handling of the virus mm -hmm. and just the persona and approach of the president. That they're making a difference between change and chaos, that it's just too chaotic. Yeah. So his base remains wedded to change. And so therefore these types of conspiracies, QAnon and, and others, the deep state still appeal to that group. Mm -hmm. But to the sort of more moderate people that voted for Trump that are now polling and saying they're gonna switch over to Biden, it's not that they wanna vote for the establishment, they just wanna vote for a little bit of stability. They want a little bit more calmness. They don't want chaos. So what I think is different in 2020 between 08, 12, and 16 is that there's, there's a group that does that is a willing to vote for less change and less chaos. And that's, and that's Biden, right? And so that's where the swing back could occur and where the swing in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Michigan will occur. Interestingly, it's not about the economy, right? Which has always been the most important thing in American elections. It's really being driven by the virus and the, and the things that have occurred in the streets yes. on social justice and the, and the reactions that we got there and that's where that generational vote may matter uh but it's very interesting right now that for the first time uh in many decades uh biden is even or even pull pulling ahead on the older vote the older vote tends to be a republican vote mm -hmm. and it's now he's either even or a little bit ahead on the older vote. And I think this explains, is best explained by this chaos argument and stability, right? And we'd rather go, go back uh, to that. And so this all though, I'll, I'll end uh, and hand over to uh, Professor Kamel. This is all a soup, if you will, for manipulation in the cyber realm. And what we were concerned with when I put my cyber security hat on is uh, much of the media has gotten this wrong, right? It was not about disinformation. It was about delegitimization, right? So disinformation is a means to a bigger end. One possibility is that you try to disinform in order to elect a particular candidate. Yes. In 2020, I don't think that's the what we're seeing in uh, cyber interference. 
cyber interference right now, particularly from the outside, is about the United States is as partisan as it's ever been, as divided as it's ever been. So let's try to make the election result. It doesn't matter who wins. We want to just simply make sure that that president is seen as illegitimate by a large percentage of the population. So this is about delegitimization. And what's been unfortunate because of his orientation to trying to be this outsider, President Trump has given more ammunition to uh, some of these foreign adversaries that want to delegitimize the election through his, his own rhetoric. There's no real indication historically and currently of, of fraud that would make a difference in the election. But to your question specifically, no, I think this is way overblown, right? And it is not a reality. However, reality doesn't matter. It's all about perception. And if the perception of manipulation, if the perception of fraud uh, can be driven up then, then, then we are going to be in a potential constitutional crisis mm -hmm. if Biden wins a close election. And I'll finish with this thought. Yes. In 2000, we had a very, very close election. George Bush, W. Bush won Ohio by less than a percent. He wins Florida by less than 500 votes. We went through an institutional process of challenge, mm -hmm. went through a court system that was seen as legitimate, but ultimately there was a moment where Vice President Gore went on television, looked at all of his supporters and said, we lost. I'm not happy about it. We contested it, but ultimately George Bush is president. And that was this legitimizing moment. And one of the concerns that I think we have right now is can we imagine a Donald Trump going on television and giving that Al Gore speech? And there's lots of questions about whether that would happen. On the reverse, if it's very close and Biden loses, I think most people think that he would go on television and make that speech. And so we have a wild card here, if this election is close, mm -hmm. about whether or not all of this, mm -hmm. and then look, the cyber manipulation will start after the election, not, <coughs> not now, if it, this thing is very, very close. And so that's the most uh, concern I have. A foreign policy will not be an issue if the United States is is, is, is near uh, a, a constitutional crisis. And if I'm sitting in the capitals of some adversaries of the United States, this is the time to push that. This is the time to kick the United States over the edge into a partisan turmoil that could last uh, for a long time. Yes. Professor Kamel, I hope that uh, sets you up for some- Yeah, all right. Thank you very much, very, very interesting. Um, I have four uh, quick responses. Uh, the first on American Jews and uh, election. Um, Jews in America consider themselves as a minority. They belong to a minority religion. They are minority in, uh, in numbers. So they think their place is inside the party of the minorities, which is the Democratic Party. And most actually of uh, Jewish American politicians, that is to say members of Congress, et cetera, uh, are uh, members of the Democratic Party. So the Democratic Party has been the home of American Jews, supportive of Israel for so many years because of that uh, reason. 
Now the Democratic Party is changing and there is something called the progressive wing within the, the party. Those are uh, young Democrats who view America, the world, Israel differently. And there are also some uh, Jews, American Jews, who are members of this, uh, of this uh, wing. So uh, their views also um, is different from, uh, from Israel and is, is more uh, liberal, more uh, in line with human rights standard and, and so on. I would argue also that the so-called special relationship, personal relationship between uh, President Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel has alienated many Democrats, okay? And the, the view uh, Netanyahu as just an extension of, uh, of Biden. And uh, that, that affected their views of the current government in, uh, in Israel and its, uh, its policies. The, the progressive wing is still small, but I would argue here from Egypt that it will be the wave of the future but still small, if they the play um, a big role in, in uh, voting for uh, Biden, uh, if they go out in big numbers, then Biden will reward them. And I will not be surprised to see some of them in key positions within the administration, either in foreign policy, defense, and other department, and he will definitely affect his uh, policies on, uh, on Israel. Uh, second, po second point from Biden and uh, Ethiopia. Definitely, if uh, uh, Trump continues to be in the, in the White House, his policy will be more assertive on Ethiopia. This issue will be on his agenda. And we already know his views now on the Renaissance uh, Dam. Uh, if uh, Biden is elected, I don't think he will uh, consider that issue a, a priority. And given uh, uh, the fact that uh, many, let's say, or some African-Americans support uh, the point of view of Ethiopia, and African Americans are an important part of the Democratic Party. So this will contribute also uh, to the fact that this issue will not be a priority for, uh, for Biden. Uh, Arabs, Egyptian, Muslims, and the election, let me look at them as Arab Americans or Egyptian Americans or Muslim Americans and how will um, they approach the, the elections. Many Arab, or not let's listen, some Arabs and some Egyptians uh, used to be uh, or used to vote uh, Republicans, mainly because of, of values or on value issues. The Republican Party is conservatives. Many Arab and Egyptians are conservative mm -hmm. in their uh, values. But I think the majority of them, majority of Arab Americans, Egyptian Americans, will vote for uh, Biden in this election because of the racist uh, tone and policy of uh, President uh, Trump, which alienated them and will probably let them uh, vote for uh, Vice President uh, Biden. Last, last point, Trump and Corona. Um, there are several ways to look at um, the American presidential election and uh, most of them are actually not flattering for uh, Vice President uh, Biden. Some uh, people look at this election as a referendum on, on Trump. It's not a competition actually between two candidates, but it is a, a, it is a referendum on, uh, on Trump. Um, I look at it actually also as a competition between um, Trump and Chrome, you know, it's not Trump and Biden, it's rather Trump and Corona. And uh, the argument of Biden is that, you know, uh, Trump has 
managed the uh, corona crisis in a very bad way. Uh, more than 200,000 Americans uh, died. And if this number dies, this number of American dies under any president, then this president should not stay in, in the White House. So it's related to Corona. Trump argument is I have nothing to do with Corona. It's, the, it's China's uh, virus. I did my best. I built you know, a great economy before Corona and I can build it again after Corona. And we're you know, in the process of getting you know, a medicine for Corona and everything will be normal. So I think Corona will be a decisive factor in, in the election, okay? And the way you interpret or the way you side either with a Biden argument or, will, will, or with a Trump argument will, will, decide, uh, will decide the election. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I think uh, we are coming now to the end of, uh, uh, of our panel. Um, um, a final question for you as two specialists. Who do you expect to win elections? Mm -hmm. Professor Richard? You're not, you're not gonna get an answer from me. Why? <laughs> Why? We can get an answer. No, no, uh, because uh, we know, were wrong before. They are experts, yes, and um, uh, given certain uh, uh, points, given certain things, given certain givens, um, uh, we may, you know, give our expectations. So what do you think? Let's hear it to Richard first. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, yes. It's, so, <laughs> he is so in the sweet I, state. I will, give, I will give a definitive answer that doesn't matter, uh, that uh, uh, Vice President Biden will win the popular vote. Yeah, that's for I sure. Think, I, that I, is a that's a guarantee. So I will, you you can play the tape back. Uh, uh, he will, popular, popular votes. But we lose. Now, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that he wins the, the election. He will be the president, yes. <laughs> But if you wanted a prediction, I'm giving you a prediction. Yes. I will stand by. Uh, he he will win the popular vote. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, if there is not, so I I I will say right now that uh, unless there is, you know, there's that famous, you know, the the unknown of the unknown. So unless there is some uh, significant incident, and the only one that I think that could really disrupt this, uh, honestly, is if. Um, uh, if Vice President Biden uh, came down positive with the virus uh, before uh, the third, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you could have a situation where if he caught this virus and became very ill, um, that that would uh, would have potentially a, a significant uh, impact. But right now, I, I I think the polls have been improved, um, and what we missed in polling in, um, in 2016, uh, that these polls are capturing a lot of this. I think it will likely be tighter uh, than uh, the polls suggest right now. Uh, but if you're putting me on the spot, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, will, um, uh, I, I think there's just too many pathways for Biden to win. And so many things have to go right for Trump for him to hold on to the presidency. So I think there's a very good chance that we will be seeing a President Biden. What I, what I think is most critical after that is uh, the margin, uh, because if the margin is close, then we're gonna have a, a rough transition. Um, if the margin in the Electoral College is not, uh, then we may, we may have a more normal transition at some point. And that will require Republicans, particularly Republican senators, to go to President Trump and say, we need a peaceful and normal transition. Mm -hmm. uh, and that may take a few weeks to happen, uh, but uh, that will be the institutional reemergence uh, that um, uh, we would need. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. Okay. 
I, I agree with Professor Richard about the popular vote. I don't think it's a prediction. I think it's uh, it's now a fact. It's statement. <laughs> because Hillary Clinton won the, uh, the popular vote. Al Gore won the popular vote before. I think it, it might have something to do with the, uh, the demography and the changing demography of, of the US. Uh, so you have more people who vote Democrats, but it's again, it's not about the popular vote. It's about electoral college and it's about Ohio and Florida and Pennsylvania. And I think it's very difficult to, to predict. Things are changing. I'll give you uh, one of the, of the changing uh, or one of the features of the changing landscape. I was just reading an, an article, I think it was published yes. in the Wall Street yes. Journal, Please, which excited a, a poll or is. a public opinion oh. survey I think oh, by Gallup, uh, uh, in which yeah, the majority of Americans... Yeah, but also voted ...that they are better, better off today than they were four years ago. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. This is a question that was raised by you know, candidate and then President Reagan in the 80s, and they keep asking this question every four years. So more than 50% of Americans as individuals, they feel that they are better off today than they were four years ago. But when they ask them, do you feel the US as a country is better off today than four years ago? The majority say no. Only about 30% say it's better. So this is a big, puzzle. Are you going to vote because you're better off or because your country is worse off? I, I cannot actually, I cannot actually answer. And I don't think we will have a result as Dr. Ha uh, Richard said on the, on the 3rd of November. It might take a few days, few weeks, but I am sure it will be a peaceful transition of power and comes January 20th there will be a, a president in the White House, either Trump or Biden, and this will be done in a democratic, peaceful way. Thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for uh, your answers. Um, uh, I am not a specialist actually in American affairs, uh, nor in well, you know comparative systems, mm -hmm. but, um, uh, but I well, I'll, your, just, your, I'll just take the threat. Professor Richard saying that stability and economy uh, are two pillars that um, are very important in the minds of American uh, electorate. And uh, speaking about stability and economy, as an outsider, not as an American, you know, as an outsider um, um, who happened to live in unstable conditions, who um, uh, um, uh, lived, who used to live in a certain or in, in, in conditions of in unstable economy and hardships. So I would say that as a citizen, I would give my uh, vote to someone who can, um, who is, um, um, who is really able to do uh, or to guarantee such things for me based on previous experience with him. For me, I can see that even it's, um, uh, uh, I don't know whether this is, uh, but even to speak about, you know, uh, the, the um, ordinary voters or the uh, popular voting or something like this, I still doubt that uh, Biden can win popular voting. No, um, because stability, stability now is an issue. Stability, stability, I mean security, security and stability, secure, uh, securing stability and security issues in the uh, United States are very prominent. And in some very important states, uh, economy is very prominent issue too. So if I am to choose actually, and um, uh, taking all in co into consideration. So I would give my vote as an American citizen, putting myself in your, in, in the foot of it, to someone who can, who is emboldened enough using the word or the term used by a uh, professor to achieve something material, materialist on, on both uh, aspects. So um, maybe we might have a, a future meeting discussing other issues 
and uh, I'm very delighted to have both of you today. I think we are all honored uh, uh, to, to have uh, both of you. Thank you very much for uh, your precious time and uh, um, see you in other and events. for your patience you very for this inconvenient uh, translation issue, but uh, we have been trying to have it uh, for you, uh, Richard, and your team, but uh, unfortunately did not succeed. It. But we succeed to have it for our Egyptian uh, participants no in Arabic. Uh, thank you very much again for your time. And uh, as an Egyptian, I say we should thank God that we are not in this position to uh, choose between uh, two candidates uh, where each of them would represent uh, a kind of risk to the world. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed until we know whose risk is uh, less than the other. Uh, and again, uh, we're looking forward to more uh, cooperation with you, uh, Cincinnati University, uh, your team. Uh, and I think this is just uh, a launching of uh, maybe a series of uh, events that we can have together. We would like to uh, share, with, to join any interesting meeting on your side. And we will be happy if you join our meeting in the next rounds, inshallah. Thank you very so much. So thank you and bye-bye. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>